Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us on such a beautiful March evening. It's finally not dark at 5 p.m., but we're still inside anyways. Um, so thank you for choosing to be here, opposed to catching those, those last evening rays. My name is Michael Denhammer, and I'll be your host and moderator for this, this evening's conversation, Hidden Histories. But before we begin, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. These nations continue to affirm their sovereignty and jurisdiction over these lands. And it's through this jurisdiction and sovereignty that we must support these nations in their assertion of their self-determination to control and manage their ancestral lands, waters, and territories. So this event is being hosted by the Center for Community Engaged Learning and our center is focused on bringing community organizations with a diversity of backgrounds and lived experiences together with faculty and students to approach complex societal challenges. We do this by working collaboratively with campus and community partners on programs and initiatives both on and off campus, this time in the virtual world. Um, throughout the pandemic, we remain committed to serving our faculty, our community partners, and our students. And at this time, our team is focusing our efforts on online engagement to ensure continued transformative learning and programming for students and community partners, and be ready when the time calls from community and faculty to find new ways to work together on societal issues that were previously unknown or unexpected. These issues are undertaken from the perspective that the university as a public citizen plays a critical role in supporting our students, faculty, and community partners to weather the immediate crisis. We are committed to strengthening the resilience and the recovery of our community, the sectors that comprise it, and the, to the creation of a more just and equitable society. So the Doing jo Stories Justice speaker series highlights the efforts of individuals, communities, and organizations. Their work recognizes our interdependence and builds power into our communities. Their stories are used to enlighten us, to engender empathy, to connect across, across difference, and to catalyze social change. This event series is focused on four themes, stories of community safety, stories of a just transition, hidden histories, and imagination. Each event brings together community members, community advocates, and theorists to discuss how they use stories in their work. We'll learn about the relational nature of storytelling and listening, and how the speakers bring reciprocity, responsiveness, and intimacy into their work, and how we as listeners do stories justice. So the theme for tonight's event is Hidden Histories, Elevating the Past for New Futures. Our understandings of our personal and cultural identities are shaped by the stories we're told and the stories we tell about the past, the present, and the future. What histories don't we know and which ones aren't taught in our schools? The histories and stories aren't stuck in the past, they're living and they shape our sense of place. So how do these hidden histories support us in reshaping our future? We'll hear from Kayla Isamura, followed by Dr. Imogene Lim, and Kirsten Van Schip, followed by Lena Minifi. Lastly, we'll have some time for some questions from you. So all those questions can be answered at slido.com with the hashtag Cecil. And um, on slido.com, you'll also have the ability to upvote the questions that, that you think are really good questions, which means that they'll likely be more likely to be answered by, by the panel today. Additionally, feel free to comment and share your thoughts and enthusiasm into the chat throughout the event, which is also to say that we'll be live tweeting some quotes throughout the event and you can join the conversation at twitter.com um, and follow us at UBC Cecil. So UBC C C E L. Okay. So I want to introduce Kayla. Kayla Isamura is a Vancouver-based photographer currently exploring themes of intergenerational trauma and racialized identity. With a background in journalism, her interest in storytelling through multimedia has been influenced by her roots as a fourth generation Japanese and Chinese Canadian. I too am a Yonsei. In 2018, Kayla produced the Suitcase Project, a multimedia exhibition examining the effects of the Japanese Canadian and American internment and incarceration on younger generations. The Suitcase Project made its debut at the Nikkei National Museum and is currently touring across Canada. Following this work, Kayla is continuing to explore narratives that often highlight and marginalize, highlight marginalized experiences. Kayla, welcome. Hi, Michael. Thanks for having me. Um, 
So, as Michael said, my name is Kayla Isamura, and I'm a fourth generation Japanese and Chinese Canadian. Um, as you heard from my bio, um, I'm also a photographer. I have a background in journalism, and uh, I actually currently work in communications as well. So, I grew up uh, here in Greater Vancouver, um, and I'm currently living on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. Um, and I think if we're talking about hidden histories tonight, um, it's also important to recognize the Indigenous histories that have been hidden as well, and um, the ongoing very real effects of those histories. And so for myself, um, I'm an East Asian multi-generational settler, and I have a lot of advantages despite being a person of color and despite the stories that I'm going to share tonight. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and leave that as something for um, everybody to think about here as well. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Um, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of a background on a little bit of history and I'm not gonna go too deep into it for time. Um, but in 1942, uh, over 22,000 people of Japanese descent living on the west coast of Canada were forcibly removed from their homes. So they were confined to prisoner of war camps in Ontario, uh, sugar beet farms across the prairies, road camps, internment camps, self-supporting camps, and temporary detention centers in BC. And so this was a result of Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii in the US um, in December 1941. But leading up to this, there was much anti-Asian sentiment in Vancouver with laws for prohibiting voting, entry to the country, what professions people could join, um, and race riots. So my dad's grandparents and parents were some of these 22,000 people. And after the war, that anti-Japanese specifically sentiment continued. So Japanese Canadians were either deported or forced to stay away from the West Coast um, until 1949. And so my dad, for example, uh, grew up in Montreal and here's just a map illustrating a little bit of where his family was before and after the war. So uh, up here in this like little orange dot is where his mom's family uh, was living near Prince Rupert before the war. Um, and as a result, they had to come down to Vancouver and go to Hastings Park, which you will may know now as today as uh, the p and &E. And um, along with um, a lot of other Japanese Canadians were living um, in the barn stalls, barn stalls at the p and &E. um, And then eventually they were relocated to Tajmi, which is now called Sunshine Valley, which is about an hour and a half east of Vancouver near Hope. Um, and that's where they were interned. And his dad's family was in Vancouver before the war. So they were actually just moved over here to Greenwood, which is about eight hours east of Vancouver. Um, and of course, because of that history, like I said, he grew up around in Montreal because his family after the war was not able to come back to Vancouver or the West Coast. So they were in lived in Ontario and then eventually Quebec. And then eventually when my dad was a teenager, they moved uh, here to Richmond. Um, so there's a lot of facets to this history, to Japanese Canadian history. And like I said, not a lot of time, but I think something that I wanted to, to mention as part of this history is the dispossession that these Japanese Canadians unknowingly faced. So while interned, properties were confiscated and liquidated by the government and Japanese Canadians with assets were required to pay for their internment. And that was primarily with belongings and property, property that were sold without their consent. So in this letter, for example, that was written to the Canadian government, this person had written, surely there must be a terrible mistake somewhere. I can't even imagine any possible reason for our property being confiscated. And knowing this, so, in 2017, um, I returned from a backing, backpacking trip. And um, after living out of a tent and living out of a backpack I, and kind of knowing a bit about this history, I was actually curious about what my own grandparents and what my great grandparents would have lost. And also what did they take with them when they went from Prince Rupert to Hastings Park to Tajmi or from Vancouver to Greenwood, not knowing that they would lose anything they left behind. And so this is a 
notice that some people would have received um, in 1942, kind of indicating how to prepare for these uh, so-called internment camps that people didn't really know what to expect or know where they were going, like what conditions they would be living in. Uh, but there were some guidelines about how much luggage you could pack, uh, you know, that sewing machines were okay, uh, food allowances um, and different things like that. Um, So as a result, uh, this question that I had for my own family um, and, and, and parts of that letter actually ev evolved into what became the Suitcase Project. So the Suitcase Project is um, a multimedia ex exhibit with photos, audio excerpts, videos um, that asked uh, fourth and fifth generation Japanese Canadians and Americans what they would pack if they were uprooted from their homes in a, no in a moment's notice. And also further, how has this history played a role in their lives today? I think especially knowing that many of us are very fortunate to not experience this same history that our ancestors faced, but knowing that this history has affected us whether we know it or not. Um, and so in 2018, this work was presented at the Nikkei National Museum in Burnaby. Um, Last year, it was supposed to be <laughs> exhibited in San Francisco, but COVID happened. Um, it was also uh, presented on Vancouver Island. Um, and of course, I'm still having conversations about this work today. So to kind of better illustrate this project, I'm gonna show you a video. Um, so, uh, oh, I might have to turn on my, I, have to, I forgot I have to turn on the sound. <laughs> um, okay, so let me stop sharing and then I'll reshare. Um, so this is a good opportunity if you want to sound a little higher, you can, and I'm going to play that video now. I wanted to sign up and participate in this project because I felt that this is, this project was a good way to get more in touch with both my family's history uh, in uh, these intern camps uh, and also find out more about uh, the lived experiences of the Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians uh, that went through this uh, troubling time in our history. My name is Thomas Tadashi Ikeda. I am a fourth fifth generation Japanese American uh, from Hawaii living in Vancouver and I'm 21 years old. So the most important item I chose I actually had originally forgot about. Um, my dad hadn't really thought about sentimental things um, but what I ended up grabbing was uh, a picture that me and my sister and a friend of mine took when uh, I took my sister to visit Tokyo. The trip was sort of her graduation present. Uh, she had graduated high school and I took her to Japan. And it was the first time she'd ever been to Japan, and that picture kind of means a lot to me for that. A lot of people living in Canada and the U.S. don't actually know about the Japanese internment camps. They have never heard about it, uh, it's never been taught to them in school. And I think it's really tragic that these stories are lost, and the hardships that the, the people that lived through this faced is kind of forgotten. I think it's different in Hawaii talking about internment camps because it doesn't seem to be forgotten there. In Hawaii, it's not necessarily constantly weighing on people, uh, but it's definitely not a forgotten event. Uh, and it's, it is taught in schools. So I feel like I take pride in being a fourth, fifth generation Japanese American because um, just looking at all the, the lived experiences of these of our families, of people who also are fourth generation, fifth generation Japanese American. We have uh, a history of being, our families well worked on plantations, canneries, doing very menial labor for very little pay. And to be where I am right now, um, the sort of living situation that I have, it gives me a lot of pride that my family was able to come from that in a new country, facing oppression and discrimination and to get to where I am right now is all based off of that. And that sort of is what I'm proud of.
Oh. Oh no. Okay. So, oh. Oh, it's really captioning me. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um yeah, so with this project, basically, my goal was to create these images um, and have conversations with uh, these fourth and fifth generation Japanese Canadians and Americans. Uh, I mean, the prompt was about packing, um, as you can see in the photos or in this photo, um, and talking about some of the things that they people had brought with them. But it was also about those um, conversations, just about the impact of this history and uh, whether or not people and what experiences people had with this history growing up. Um, and so actually with this project, when we talk about engaging the Japanese Canadian community and reciprocity, I actually didn't expect anybody to be interested in this project. And that's because for me um, growing up, I didn't know really any Japanese Canadian people outside of my family. So in my experience or the experience that I've had um, is the Japanese Canadian community being quite dispersed because of the history of internment, because families were not uh, allowed to come back to the West Coast and, and were obviously removed from their homes and, and had to restart elsewhere. Um, but in the end, I created about uh, 60 or just over 60 uh, portraits uh, with people living in greater Vancouver, on Vancouver Island and Seattle, Washington. And so I think for some people, this was an opportunity to have these conversations about this history, about their experiences, about their families. Um, and I think one thing about building recipro reciprocity for me um, and doing this project is for myself having that shared lived experience as a fourth generation Japanese Canadian. So when I was talking to people, a lot of our conversations, I mean, I wasn't trying to really insert myself into the conversation, but I think for, for myself, I have that level of understanding of where people are coming from and especially the questions that I was able to ask people. Um, and I think it's also important to talk about things like trust and transparency. So in this project, I was in people's homes and really getting an intimate look at their lives in a lot of ways. <laughs> so looking at personal possessions, uh, entering private spaces um, and having conversations that they might not have had with people prior to that. Um, and something else that I found to be really important is also just thinking about being opening, open to listening, learning, um, and being open to different perspectives. So I think I expected for myself to share some experiences with uh, some of these participants going into this project, but I also learned a lot from people too, uh, especially people who had a different different experience growing up. So with people who maybe had more knowledge of this history growing up or were more embedded into the Japanese Canadian or Japanese American community growing up. Um, and with this project too, one of the other things that resulted from that was uh, talking about, um, uh, so social justice was brought up. Um, so some people were talking about, um, the proposed Muslim ban at the time in the US, uh, refugee crisis, um, undocumented folks. Um, and for me, this experience that many Japanese Canadians had experienced has really driven a lot of the wor other work that I do. Uh, so thinking about, um, for myself, work that I do uh, um, in the downtown east side, uh, working with other uh, marginalized groups of people and vulnerable folks, um, and highlighting, uh, being able to highlight those those narratives as well. Um, and I think it's really important to uh, implement historical projects in public education because I was not somebody who grew up knowing about my Japanese heritage or my Japanese Canadian heritage. Um, I'm also of Chinese ancestry. So I think growing up more with my mom's side of the family and not having that uh, forced assimilation, um, I was just more exposed to that culture growing up. 
but I didn't really feel like I knew that I was Japanese Canadian until I was like in my late like after like in college basically um and I learned I didn't learn any of that from my family or from my dad I learned that from well not from my family I learned some of it from my sister who's done a lot of her own work and research around around her family history and stuff and about but also just from the Japanese com Canadian community and friends that I've made um, over the years. So like when we, I mean, part of this project is I kind of wanted to talk about intergenerational trauma, uh, maybe indirectly, but thinking about that lack of uh, shared history or that sh lack of um, shared knowledge around this history. So even the fact that I think my dad will often say, well, my parents didn't talk about this history with me and therefore I don't really know a lot about it. And I think that's fair. I mean, this was a big traumatic thing that happened, but I find that like for myself and a lot of other younger people, we're having a lot of questions ar around this and we wanna talk about this. And in this project too, it was really interesting because some of the people who participated who had kids, were having these conversations with their kids and or had asked me how can I explain this history to my child and I'm like you know I'm kind of learning about this too I don't really know how to have that conversation with a child but I think it was really great to hear that people were doing that um, and even having conversations within their families about this history or about the experiences or like learning new things as well um, even in my own family I've heard some of my cousins talk about how that's shifted within uh, their homes. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. I think for myself doing this project, it, it encouraged me to try and, you know, ask more questions or trying to even ask like my, my dad <laughs> more stories from his childhood, but um, he doesn't really talk like to talk to me or my sister directly about about his own stories so there's still a lot of work to do but um yeah I mean I think through this project it's just been really cool to to see these conversations happen um so I think that's all I have for you today uh so I'll pass it back to Michael thank you so much for sharing a little bit about your project Kayla and just to remind anyone, if you have any questions for Kayla, do put them in the slido.com hashtag Cecil. Um, yeah, I remember what Kayla, I remember when your project came out a few years ago, it opened up a, a few conversations in my family, um, you know, asking, asking my grandmother what she chose to bring um, with her, but also what she chose to leave behind as well. And, um, you know, she was seven seven or eight years old um when they were dispossessed from their uh dispossessed uh and relocated from their farm in surrey and um some of the memories of the things she had to leave behind what she chose to hide within the farmhouse was um things that that i had never heard before that my mother had never heard before and um really sparked a lot of amazing conversations and stories that that we were hearing for the first time so thank you for that um okay so next, I want to invite uh, Dr. Imogene Lim and Kirsten Van Shipt up to the virtual stage, I guess. Um, and I'll introduce them as well. So Dr. Imogene Lim is a descendant of Cumberland and Vancouver's Chinatown. Dr. Lim is a founding member of the Chinese Canadian Historical Society of BC and a former board member as well. She is also an ethno-archaeologist by training and currently with Vancouver Island University's Department of Anthropology and Global Studies program. In its inaugural year, 2018, Dr. Lim was awarded the VIU President's Award for Community Engagement um, under the Community Engaged Scholarship Research and Creative Activity Award. She's also the recipient of the 2019 Dean's Scholarship Research and Creative Activity Award. With the BC Legacy Initiatives Advisory Council, she worked on the historic sites and celebration book projects. Imogene currently sits on the board of the Chinese Canadian Museum. So if you're in Vancouver and you haven't had a chance to make it there yet, or, or wherever you are, and you haven't had a chance to make it there yet, I encourage you to reserve a spot at the inaugural exhibit, a seat at the table. 
um, Imogene's expertise on Chinese Canadian communities and collaboration with museums is reflected in the exhibit, 150 years and counting, fighting for justice on the coast, 2017, which she co-developed. And I also want to introduce Kirsten Van Chip, who is one of uh, Imogene's students. So Kirsten currently resides on, in Powell River. And through Kirsten's research, she's uncovered a, a unique hidden history in Powell River, which we're very excited to have Kirsten share today. So Dr. Imogene, I'll pass it over to you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'd like to acknowledge that I am zooming in from the uh, traditional territories of the Sinai peoples in which I live, learn, and thrive. And I will emphasize the thrive portion in part because um, one of the things that I often say to my students that I'm still evolving as a human being. And I would say I'm doing that in terms of the research that I do and in working with uh, the communities. So I'm gonna do a screen share and let's see whether it all works. So I'm gonna just use this as uh, sort of the background as I speak to you. And, and part of uh, showing this is to make that connection to uh, Cumberland. So part of one of the questions that was asked of us was to talk about our community engaged uh, approach. <laughs> this is where I say the evolving part comes in because when I arrived at Vancouver Island University, I was still trying to figure out, well, what am I going to become here? Because I did my doctoral research in Tanzania. So, so most people don't know this, uh, that I actually can have a conversation in Swahili. Uh, they look at me and they assume, obviously, I am quote unquote of East Asian descent and I must know at least some Asian language. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I regularly say, and Gong, which means I understand, but I don't speak, <laughs> just to stop the conversation about whether I can have a conversation in the Cantonese language. Um, so part of, like I said, showing this slide is to make that uh, connection. So I'm going to sort of jump forward a little bit and then go backwards because I was actually working on some materials in Nanaimo before, uh, as I say, that fateful day in November 2001, 20 years ago, I got a call in my office and it was somebody from Cumberland and they wanted an academic to say, hey, do you know that there's this uh, plot of land, it's uh, Cumberland's Chinatown. It also has the number one Japanese town and something should be done because it's, it's under threat of um, losing, I shouldn't say losing, but becoming permanently a rod and gun club when in fact uh, there is a desire from a number of people for it to be a park. So if you weren't there 20 years ago and you go up to Cumberland today, people regularly say, wow, this is so amazing. Cold Creek Historic Park. Uh, you know, they've, they've got a walking uh, area where they've got uh, signage for not only Ch Chinatown, but also the number one Japanese town. And they think it's always been here. Well, Historically, the location has always been there, but what you see today was not there. And back in 2001, it was a serious fight in, in the sense of what is going to happen to this property uh, in terms of its heritage. So that was uh, what I might say, it, it sort of kick-started my journey to where I am today. Uh, so I am a descendant of Cumberland's Chinatown. So it wasn't a mystery to me, but it was certainly hidden from many, many other people 
because I think when uh, people talk about uh, Chinese Canadians and the early history, uh, there's two things that pop into people's head. The railway, so the CPR, and then the gold rush, or I should reverse it, gold rush first, then the CPR. And then after that, it's like, oh, Vancouver. And they think everything that has to do with history is Vancouver or possibly Victoria, uh, because Victoria was the very first uh, Chinatown in, in BC and Canada. So like I said, the hidden history is actually in front of our eyes. Part of it is, do we recognize what is there? So this is where, like I said, uh, the beginnings of my journey as a heritage advocate. Uh, besides being a heritage advocate, it's also about social justice, making a statement that the histories of all peoples matters, and that includes Chinese, Japanese, Indigenous. Uh, Cumberland also had a Black community. All of these were there, but people weren't seeing it. Of course, as we say, fast forward 20 years, people recognize it. Uh, they recognize that this is uh, an important part. But if you look at the headline from the 2002 Vancouver Sun, it says cultural imperialism. When Cumberland officials decided to redevelop their bulldozed Chinatown, they consulted with many community groups, but ignored the Chinese themselves. So this is where I injected myself. And like I said, when I got that call in November, the person who called me, Mark Summer, he actually did not know I was a descendant of Cumberland. So uh, a happy meeting uh, to, for, for his call and for my participation in uh, what I call the, the fight for Cumberland and its heritage. So, uh, in terms of reciprocity, obviously there is a direct connection. The other thing that I said, I'm sort of backtracking, I actually started with this particular project, Nanaimo's Chinatowns. And this was one of the first uh, more expansive plaques to be put up in the city of Nanaimo that wasn't specifically about white colonial history. So I was really fortunate when this occurred that um, two of the elders of the community were able to participate. So, so this was a, an actual exchange between those from the city, from the museum, my participation as an academic and the community coming together saying, yes, this is, these are the images that we would like uh, shown. These are the stories we would like stated. Uh, and from producing this particular plaque, there have been additional plaques that are again, much more expansive, also much more diverse in conversation. So these are all very important aspects to acknowledge in every community. What we tend to forget is that when people settled, whether it was in Vancouver, Victoria, up and down the island throughout BC, we were a multicultural group of people entering into what became BC. Uh, things have, these stories have become hidden or actually forgotten. And part of that is many of the people who came who were racialized, they were certainly for Vancouver Island, they were in extractive industries. So when those extractive industries uh, became less, where were they going to find work? They left. So they migrated to other larger communities. So then you come back and you, you know, as uh, communities develop and grow, 
those original communities no longer exist or they're very, very few. So my last slide is, is this. And this is taken from uh, the 1897 Chinese and English phrase book and dictionary. So in the back of the book, there are place names of British Columbia. So when you look at these names, you're thinking, wow, I didn't know there were that many places. And oh my gosh, they, they actually have Chinese names associated with them. Uh, so that's, as I said, the reminder that there are so many places throughout British Columbia that have a connection to Chinese uh, individuals. Uh, they could have been working on a farm, they could have been in mining, uh, they could have businesses. These are the things that we don't see today. So what I noticed in looking at these place names, places like Shamanus, Lady Smith, uh, Cobble Hill, so if you're from the island, Ladysmith, Shamanus, Cobble Hill, these are places that do not scream out, wow, there was a Chinese community here. But like I said, these are names listed and it's 1897. That is very, very early on. So I make the point that uh, these places have been forgotten over time in terms of the other peoples who helped uh, develop these, uh, the industries and the communities themselves. So with that, <laughs> Kirsten, uh, she, she took a course with me uh, last semester and she, she lives in Powell River and she commented, oh, I discovered there was a China block and I got all excited. So I'm not gonna tell you why I got all excited besides saying it was the China block. So I'm going to pass it over to <clears throat> Kirsten. Okay, well, thank you. Yeah, um, so my interest in this did start in that class with Imogene. Um, and it was really tied also to um, the project I did for that class that, that looked at the history of BC. It was looking at the BC sugar refinery um, marketing campaign between, I don't know, I can't remember the exact dates right now. Oh my goodness. But anyway, what, what came through with that was, um, the anti-Asian racism at that time was so similar to what was happening in our current days of this pandemic. Um, and uh, a part of that rhetoric is this discourse of, of kind of telling people that look of East Asian descent that you don't belong here in one way or another. This is a message that's being told um and and with that we other discussions it kind of led into i asked around on facebook about any chinese known history in my community of pal river and yeah i heard the name china block and shack street and Ch uh, shack town um and i told imogene all about it um but before I asked about this on Facebook, these were not names you would hear. I, I had never heard these names or references before. And as it turned out, one of the last Chinese or marginalized um, residential areas was only two blocks from the home I grew up in. So, um, I decided to look into it some more. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So let's see. So this is China Block. It's this second building here. And this is from 1915. Um, 
so it it's called formally the Sing Lee Building, and Sing Lee owned and operated the Sing Lee Company General Store and Star Restaurant. There was additional commercial space that had a clothing store, a pool room, um, a tailor shop, and some other things cycled through. Um, and the upper portion is housing and boarding rooms. So Singh and his wife and children lived here, as well as staff for his company and mill employees. Um, even on the census data, this is referred to as Singh's rooms, which I kind of liked. Um, so he operated the business here until he sold to the Powell River Company in 1917. Um, and at that time, it became known as the Brooklyn Block. So here we see in 1941, the original building was raised and replaced with this modern build um, and called Powell Stores. Um, the picture on the right I took just a few days ago. So a quick little history here um, to make a point is the Powell River Company sold the mill and actually all of Townsite to Macmillan Blodell in 1955. In 1961, Powell's stores became the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, several more transitions took place before the building was left vacant. And in 2019, it reopened as Townsite Public Market. And so the main point I'm trying to illustrate with that is that there were many transitions over the years and with each, um, some of its historical significance has been lost. And on that note, there is what I call a celebrated story of our community history, which revolves around the Powell River Company, the mill, and the heroic pioneers who championed a region. Um, town site was designated as a National Historic District of Canada in 1995, one of only seven and the only one in Western Canada. Over 400 of the original buildings remain. There are commemorative plaques that you can see if you take the walking tour through Townsite Heritage Society um, to mark prominent residential buildings like the Powell River Company manager's residence and the guest house, for instance. There's another large plaque that stands in the commercial area just above the mill where um, the previous building shown is. Um, and this one honors Townsite's founders, Brooks and Scanlon, um, the original owners of the Powell River Company. And I'm going to use a quote here from one of the earliest local history books called Powell River, The First 50 Years. Um, and it really kind of sums up the sentiment of this story as being at the heart of Powell River identity. Um, so it reads, if it weren't for the mill, perhaps I would not even have been born. This town would not exist. It is the core of our heritage and the pillar of our community. And so um, most of my research at this point, <clears throat> excuse me, is not directly with the community, but in the archives, um, which leaves room, a lot of empty space, a lot of absence because at that 
the time era I'm looking at, there just was sort of a general lack of acknowledgement of certain populations. But through the census material of the 1911 and 1921 census, I found that there was indeed a substantial Chinese population, especially compared to the overall population of Powell River. Um, so occupations ranged from laborers in logging, sawmills and mining, to dishwashers, uh, camp cooks, farmers, gardeners. There were many employed by private families and listed in the census as domestic or servant. Some opened laundry businesses. Others found employment at boarding houses, hotels. And this picture is, um, is, is at the Powell River Company guest house. Um, so, sorry, I kind of lost my place there for a second. Um, but what I'm trying to say is juxtaposed with all the other plaques and commemoration for one, one part of the story, there's very little actual historical data evidence besides the census numbers that reveal um, the Chinese community in Powell River. Uh, as well, that's reflected in the contemporary stories we tell. Like I, I said, I really didn't have any idea. And aside from being gone in my early, uh, late teen, early adult years, um, I grew up here um, and my family has been here for several generations and I still didn't know. So yeah, the absence in the archives and <clears throat> the stories being told, I feel have a very profound impact on, on community identity, individual identity, um, values, ideologies, and really every time one story takes precedence over the others, you're passing on different ideas about value, about people, and, and these get reinforced, however subtle or blatant, um, every time we share the, these stories. And so part of my big aspiration, I guess, in this research is to build this bridge to share the stories that um, I can uncover of these lives behind the scenes of this heroic town becoming a town um, to see the unseen and to give honor to the lives whose contribution made the celebrated story possible in the first place. Um, so I am not at this stage. I, I just have more research to do before this, but um, I would love to engage the, the public, whether it's through the museum here or even through a blog with the museum or, you know, maybe plaques. I don't know exactly, but I, I do feel that it's really important to tell a holistic history um, like Imogene was, was saying. So I guess I'll just end there. So thank you. So I wanted hey. to, oh, go ahead. to make, make a comment. Uh, you know, when uh, Kirsten and I were, were talking about her presentation and she showed me the picture of that, the group and I said, that is so reminiscent of the last spike and the building of the railway in the sense that a large number of the workers are erased from the photograph. So if you look at that photograph, it is the white laborers that are part of that photograph. And, uh, you know, I, I am thrilled that uh, Kirsten has taken on this task of exploring 
uh, Powell River's multicultural communities because uh, in her, as I say, digging in the archives, she also has noted the South Asian and the Japanese Canadian community. So there is much more, which is true of all the communities up and down the island and, and elsewhere. And we tend to forget that. And for me, as an educator, what I think is important is that these are stories in all of our communities. And yet, uh, in the BC K-12 curriculum, there is this larger discussion of marginalized peoples. And we're talking about, you know, marginalized early settlers, you know, the non-Indigenous marginalized uh, set settlers. And the examples don't have to come from Vancouver. They can come from your own community, but because it's hidden, Nobody knows to, to 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 actually make reference. Like you don't have to go on the field trip outside of your community. It may actually be within your community, and I think that's a really important thing to remind everyone that if you don't look, you're not actually going to see. And as as Kristen is herself an example, she grew up in Powell River. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll keep quiet now. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kirsten and Imogene. Those are it's a it's a it's a wonderful find, and and I think it's also exciting. I I mean I'm a nerd in the way that I'd love to pour through archives as well. So I imagine it's a really um a joyful experience to actually like go through these through newspapers, through photographs, and and see what's available and and all the fonds that have been archived so diligently to this point. Um, okay, so we'll we'll have you two back shortly. After, after Lena and I have a, have a conversation for a moment. So I'd love to introduce Lena Minifi to the virtual stage. Uh, Lena is a Gikala and British digital strategist, impact producer, and Stories First founder, um, expertly engaged niche and BIPOC audiences internationally on projects like Indian Horse, The Grizzlies Movie, Monkey Beach, America Divided, and most recently, BC A History, um, yet to be released. So Lena was awarded the 2019 Fellowship Banff Accelerator for Women in Business and a producer of a four-part documentary series, BC A History. Lena uses her education in indigenous governance and new media, blending digital and grassroots strategies on social change, education, and justice initiatives. So Lena joined the panel very, very, very last minute, just on Tuesday, actually. So we're gonna have a conversation. Thank you. I was like, thank you, Michael. Very generous. I'm. It's really nice to be uh, follow at see Kayla's work and Imogene's and um, Kirsten's. Uh, it's really inspiring to see this work, and and it's something I've fallen in love with. Uh, the deep digging for the last uh, three years. It'll probably be three, three and three quarter years by the time we're done our series project, which is a four part series on the racialized history of I say the West Coast, but all over BC. And um, then we have an interactive digital media component that'll be along that with a lot of the stuff that couldn't make it on video, but things that are not even discoverable and oh, it spans over 200 years of racialized history from all over uh, every corner in BC and sometimes America too, and Alaska. Awesome, I, I, I can't wait to see it. So that's, that, that's, that's really exciting. Um, yeah. There's so many stories here that, that often get, that, un, that are untold or undertold. Um, so just getting started, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what called you into uh, a lot of the historical work that you're doing now? Um, a, a, a dearth, I guess, <laughs> of, uh, of people and of stories that have, have made it through to, to either um, our textbooks or our TV or online. I, I did... I mean, I grew up in a world where I couldn't even look at my own nation online. I say the kids now, they can type in their own nation and see their language and sometimes apps with their own language. And um, so I'm Simshian Gehahla, which is, uh, so we speak Simshian, but Smalyak is our language. And uh, my dad's side is British, so third generation uh, British, I say, settler or occupier. Um, and that side of the family was brought over. I can tell you exactly where that was too, but they were brought over during, um, the boom, the boom of uh, resource and energy in um, 
in the in the 50s so in northern bc that's how i came to be here uh so i was i, I mean our company like screen time pictures and 1871 productions answered an rfp to knowledge network they were handing in a, a they wanted something to celebrate the you know other 150 years of bc and i really was um around during that time on indian horse and um we just I just started having conversations with Jennifer Chu, who's the senior researcher. She's an amazing um, researcher um, who's been on <laughs> since the beginning. And just having conversations about what, who's, but whose story are we telling? Like whose story is this that's being done at, at the company and, and why and, like, um, and how can it be different than um, what people expect or what they, um, and how can it be more what they need? And so Knowledge has been a really good partner and collaborator and actually, support us doing things differently from the beginning. But we had, we just handed them, um, me and Jen stayed up till midnight, sometimes even at Christmas, just like looking and reading uh, on racialized histories from all over BC, like books, magazines, master's thesis, PhDs, uh, oral history that was recorded. And it was just like, how can we just show um, the true story uh, of the multiplicities and the multi-narrative um, uh, the multi-narrative voices that sort of make up where we are today. It's, it's, it's not something that one white explorer and all the Caucasian historians have kind of written down, which I grew up my whole life reading, by the way, the tourist pamphlets of um, what we expect to be like the, the lauded accolades of the discovery and the um, and, and who made those towns. So, and I just want to say this too. I just want to introduce that I'm I'm, I'm British and I'm I'm and I'm Gehala. So, um, my British uh, background and my family came. You know, they came from Britain, from Saskatchewan, then Quebec, and then my grandpa's an engineer who he deceased last year, a year ago, um, and came in with this boom of resources. And then my parents met during all this resource extraction in the north. So my part of my family, part of me, um, is settler and colonial as well. And I find that we all want to like say, oh, we didn't partake in um, displacement or <laughs> extraction. Um, most of our families have come to BC to try to have a better life in some way. And a lot of that revolves around resources and extraction industries and um, trade and economy and goods. That's how everybody kind of lands here and mixes. Um, so that's always, I always want to be honest about like, we all have a part of coming to BC because the original peoples here are different um, and they get, and they purposely are erased in order for us to have these narratives, these dominant narratives keep it continue. It's really yeah. Pretty, but. <laughs> Th thanks for saying that, Lena. And it, and it made me, I was thinking about that as, as Imogene and um, Imogene was sharing, um, the backbones of of what society is today, um, and those stories are often left behind as well. Um, so I know it's incoming, but with what you're what you've been given the um, what you're allowed to share, could you tell us a little bit about this four part docu series, BC A History, yeah. and, and some of the work that's gone into that? Yeah, it's it's immense, and um, uh, and Imogene Lim is actually so happy that we got to have. Um, speak with her and have her on, on uh, predominantly in one of the episodes speaking. So it's, it's an honor to be in the webinar with her. Um, uh, I we actually got together probably a list of over two hundred people to speak to in BC, <laughs> and we aimed for everybody. So we were trying, um, we were pushed to aim towards more authors and academics, of course verified people who have authority to speak about things but I was really insistent that we speak to oral historians and um, those that work with sort of family archives and and a mixture of those histories because to me in my culture um, oral historians and people who carry those knowledge and those storytellers and story keepers are just as important and also some community historians who are advocates for for this um, I brought into the project as well so definitely broke down that academic um, and uh, um, like, and more like theorists, we have those mixed in as well. But we end up having a list of two hundred. We end up interviewing seventy across BC, um, and then uh, from there, like 
the breaking it down to four hours. So each episode is 56 minutes. Um, each episode has about 10 chapters. We go, it's not in any sort of uh, historical order. We could do it by subject for each of the series. So the first one is mostly about indigenous displacement, uh, criminalization, um, why newcomers came here, um, how BC sort of, um, how James Douglas sort of de declared BC as, as the Britain's own. And then everyone wants to, you know, say 1871 British, you know, this peak moment where BC joined Canada and it was like this some sort of high point, but it's actually a denouement. <laughs> it's like we were broke. They had spent all the money in the Caribou Wagon Road. They were completely in debt. Nobody trusted their leadership. <laughs> and they kind of were like, well, we need the railway now. And this road, we need to kind of um, absolve our debts by joining the Federation, so our federal government. So, um, so it starts with sort of this idea of change uh, and persistence. So we kind of go through Indigenous displacement and residential school, the Indian Act, the Potlatch Ban, trying to get rid of our own governments through the Potlatch Ban, and then come back to this point of resilience and um, resistance towards that and resurgence in our culture. I want to speak to what Kayla said earlier as far as like, um, so that's like the that's like the entry episode. And I don't know if I can get into more, but each of them are, are joined like the next chapter and hours about the people who fought for like better human rights and labor rights. And um, the third chapter is sort of about um, migration and, and resilience and the people who, who uh, came here for a better life and who they are and what they experienced and oppression and how they got through. And then the fourth chapter, I'm gonna leave a mystery for you guys. But, uh, but uh, I, I want to talk about like I, I, who I did study with because I did actually end up studying history, but not as a major. It's just part of our indigenous my indigenous studies degree um, under Gerald Bisner, who is a historian, and I got to work with him for a couple of years. He really talks about resilience, right, and survivance. So I am interested in intergenerational trauma, but I have to say I'm way more interested in, in cumulative resilience because uh, all we don't know the stories of how we kept each other alive and. And during um, a lot of this, like our communities actually helped each other out. So when the Chinese gardeners were like denied from buying land and being able to do gardening, we're like, indigenous people were like, well, we'll open our land up. We're not allowed to actually farm and sell vegetables to anybody, or we're not allowed to make any trade economy and we're not allowed to run businesses to make money. Um, they totally blocked us off from there. And we have to stay on our reserves. Um, these two came together. So people were farming on indigenous land and able to sell. And like, there's this, these places of sort of coexistence and shared resilience that um, I wish we were able to dig into more in this long series. It's hard to be nuanced in TV. It's better to be nuanced in a PhD or master's in a book. It's really hard to do on TV. But this website we're doing um, in, in conjunction is mostly writing. So we get to dig in more with the writing. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing a little bit about it. The, um, the indigenous Chinese partnership around farming reminds me of all our father's relations as well. And yeah. As, as many of the, you, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah, exactly. As many UBC I've students. known Larry for, for years. So yeah, for, before that film, but, but that's just, it's an example, but there are, are times when we, we get together and, and there's cumulative resilience, like in the town of Paldi, we weren't able to, to deal with that in the film as or in the series as well, but there's a place at Paldi where there's like a accumulation of four different languages in this mill town where everybody was like predominantly non-white for years and years until the town um, went down on the island. And the, uh, you know, concepts of Chinook that's in the Chalice language mixed with Chinook, mixed with, um, you know, like four different languages. So BC has always been this place of connection and we don't think about like Victoria in the 1870s. It was actually like a, it was almost like Geneva. It was a multicultural town. Like there was like more black people at double the place after Douglas opened up our um, border to sort of people who were free, um, free men. And, and there was like a Chinese and Japanese and indigenous all coming together and working trade economy and all becoming merchants and like really doing well. Um, until these, these periods of oppression when people think there's scarcity and po politics change and they start to get more insular and segregated and they start to um, fear the other. And you can see these waves in BC. 
I have a bigger perspective because we've been doing 200 years. But these waves of um, generosity and resilience and coming togetherness. And then when things turn in economy and um, politics get strange and people get othered and you start to lock them up and displace them and uh, treat them like enemies, which we know this keeps repeating. So. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, it reminds me a lot of our last speaker series about how um, scarcity plays into that, but also um, how, how enclosure happens as well, um, both through stories, through, through taxes, um, and through who, who has the rights to do what. Um, yeah, so I do want to get to a few more questions. So just moving on to them a little bit, how do you, how do you, as you're, as you're hearing both the oral and, um, and I guess the expertise, expertise stories, um, how do you build reciprocity into those projects? And um, through that, how do you connect the communities that you're talking to, to the histories that you're sharing? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and because we've been working in COVID for the last year, it's funny, my practice is usually always community-based, like being out there constantly talking. As I said, we like initially had 200 people then down to 70. Um, we're trying to keep people uh, informed <laughs> and, and trying to make those connections. It's really difficult with a small documentary team to do. You need to have hands and, and, and time and space, um, which has just been eaten away during COVID. But we started uh, a year before we started shooting, sort of talking to these, talking to people we were interested in, in, in doing. Then we built a research panel of panelists who were from diverse communities that were a mixture of historians, uh, filmmaker and uh, experts to kind of make sure that we were covering the gamut. Um, we were informed by Knowledge Network and they did a stakeholders outreach about what education was sort of missing in these gaps. I'm from Northern BC, so I was really advocating for Northern BC films as well as like constantly uh, advocating for um, making sure that we had as much representation as possible. But um, we, you know, we really just had to get champions on our side and our research panels was, was part of having that, but also just talking to our interviewees as much as we could. I mean, people on the screen shared their, their photos with us. Right now we're in a process of um, uh, making those photos beautiful, uh, doing touch-ups and Photoshop and, and um, part of the process is giving some of those back. Um, I implemented the Indigenous uh, Screen Office and Imaginatives Indigenous Protocols for working on screen in, in communities. I don't think this has ever been done this way, but I contacted 50, probably about 52 nations uh, at the very beginning uh, in development before we started uh, production uh, in order to tell them what we we're doing having meetings with uh, representation, letting them know what we're aiming for. Um, then asking and asking permission to show up in First Nations territories if we can shoot, asking permission to tune the stories, and then training my whole entire team on protocol and doing anti-racism training within the production team and crew. Um, hiring BIPOC for our production team was uh, underneath me as I led because I knew uh, who we were in the community and having um, uh, the most diverse team we could have really would give um, space to uh, acknowledging and sort of being accepted in the communities we went to as well as like cross learning and then people on my team also understood pr protocol besides me so I'm not the only person on the team so I had end up having like seven indigenous people on the team and um, five um, people from Chinese background. And we're still sort of um, trying to hire BIPOC all the way through promotion. Um, and then uh, when it came to archives, this is a really tough one. Um, I wanted to go to sort of smaller archives and communities uh, in BC and museums and uh, collections from First Nations. Everyone is closed during COVID. So we had like 26 repositories totally unavailable. Um, and there's still some that are being closed down that we don't have access to. So we had to get from bigger archive places that were open, but I went through a process of getting those archives in front of First Nations because RBCM released about 16,000 archives this year that were First Nations, but they 
but there was no community consultation really about releasing them. So I've tried to ask as many people I can who are not in COVID crisis um, and send them the photos and ask them and told them about the context we were using in and what they would be used in, um, as well as Black archivists as well. Um, we're putting together a list afterwards. Um, other people who requested high res, we were gonna give it to them. And then those um, Black archivists that we worked with on the Black stories, um, I'm trying to provide them some resources. So if they get asked questions and everything, they can have like a handout that's easy for them because so many people in our, they're in, in the black community, especially in Vancouver right now are being descended upon for this information and they always have to ask, answer questions. So trying to give them some sort of a uh, handout and, sh and um, um, uh, the data so they can actually do less work uh, when it comes to like constantly answering outsiders questions. So these are some of the things <laughs> uh, built into is we're, we're going to get money in order to do some community screenings. So we get to go out to community and do some sort of launch, but we need to make sure that everybody has their vaccines. So that's, that's some of it. <laughs> but, uh, it's not over because we're not, we're, we're still in post-production um, and still designing the digital media timeline. But there's, those are the, some of the ways we can do things while we have to also stay away from First Nations communities. So we probably, I probably half the places we're supposed to film in, we didn't go to because um, the pandemic happened and we tried to hire remote communities or we try to work around it in some way um, and still keep the story on if we can find archives. But that's the biggest respect is like not breaking um, pandemic rules when um, First Nations didn't want any outsiders. So that's pri primarily the, the focus. That's a long answer, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, no, th thank you for that. And it's, um, you know, you're overlapping like uh, cultural protocol with with film protocol, with research protocol, with COVID protocol. Um, and it, it, it's a, uh, yeah, that box can get pre pretty narrow, for sure. And um, I, I think it's just fascinating to consider how, um, how these, um, these remote nations, how you how you bring protocol into the digital space as well. And it's, um, I know there's been some amazing work done at, by a few scholars at UBC to to create these um, you know these warnings that come up on the screen to make sure that you know like what content you're engaging with and, and what it means to be having access to yeah. that as well. And most of the archives are right now in limbo. I just have to say this: <laughs> we're in this limbo part where I would keep I, I was telling people as I emailed them or called them, you know, while they're like in crisis like a lot of the times, or don't. First Nations don't have a person that's always in charge of their either their communications department or their archive or their cultural department. Some people are very ready because they're over researched and they're over um, uh, over researched and over questioned. There's some communities that are like very prepared. They're like, this is what we have to do in order to follow our um, to do any research or filming here. We're totally prepared because everyone comes here and descends upon us constantly. And there's some places that only have two people who work for their band and they're just like, we don't have the resources or uh, time to actually take in uh, this consideration. So we have to be very respectful of that. So everyone's in a different, every nation's in a different place. But I really, the emphasis is always like in 10 years, DRIP is gonna be implemented and that's uh, BC's under uh, United Nations um, Declaration for Indigenous Peoples. And we have choices over our own intellectual property, our own photos, our own stories. And I'm trying to do this work in order to implement it. I think I'm the first person to be able to actually, I negotiated with the broadcaster too, that if they changed anything or if anything happened to the show, they have to go back and then do that protocol and they have to understand that that relationship has already been done and those things are being used in a certain context. I don't think anybody's ever put that into their license or contract agreement. So most of my work is advocacy doing these things for the first time. So it's... Yeah, I imagine you're working against... Um everything going in the opposite direction for that kind of stuff and it's it's really important to know that like that consent is ongoing so yeah um, and and also with our with our protocols um and following indigenous screen offices um indigenous protocols which you can see on imagine.org site imagine.org um we uh, made sure all of our contracts were in plain language um we implemented so material releases or personal releases um i put it this is really, really technical, but I, I started to put in um, like an escrow on the top of the thing. So people, if they interviewed us and then they felt 
like in the next two days or 48 hours, they felt like something they said was wrong. Like, oh, I said Uncle Tom instead of Uncle Dom. Or, or like I said, like this thing instead of that thing that they could come back and we can kind of try to rectify it or get them back on screen or, um, and if not, then we would, they would have full consent that we would be able to go ahead and then I'd come back to them if there was any sort of issues. But we, protocol is not just a checkbox. It's an ongoing thing. It's been hard to do during digital. But that's mm-hmm. a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> It's a lot of stuff to take in consideration, but it's a huge project. And um, I don't think there's ever been a, a film or a series like this in BC at all, of its kind ever. So it's going to be a huge legacy project. Mm, yeah. And um, any any ideas uh, to, to timelines when, when the public can expect it? Yeah. We're going to say fall of this year and uh, there'll be, there'll be lots of advertising around it, hopefully, and there'll be a public place to be able to, that will invite people to come to if everybody is vaccinated and, and we're allowed. Yeah. Finger, fingers crossed. Um, everything goes well and we can, we can watch a screening of it um, in the fall. So I'm going to skip the last question just to move into a Q and A and there's a really good question here. Um, so I'll invite Sydney to come share. Lena, thank you so much for sharing your process. It's, um, it sounds like a lot, but it's it's super important. So it's it's really appreciated to hear you talk about it. Thank you. Okay, and we'll also invite the panel back up here too. Hi everyone. Um, so I'll start us off on our Q and A portion of tonight's event. Uh, I first want to thank all of the speakers tonight um, for speaking to your work and uh, your practices and the histories that you're uplifting. Um, it's been really enlightening to hear um, how that process has worked, how you've worked with communities, and what you've uncovered um, throughout those processes. Um, so the most upvoted question in the Slido currently is to everyone: um, As these marginalized histories are surfaced and shared, how do we build space for joyful stories from the past? So I'll post that into the chat for reference um, and I'll pass it off first to Kayla. Uh, Sure, yeah, so if you don't mind, I might actually just share my screen again quickly. Um, I saw that question post in the chat and it made me think of a couple projects I did, photo projects I did after I did the suitcase project because I also wanted to do something a little bit more, I guess, joyful. <laughs> um, and so I think it's really, uh, when we look at that question, building space for joyful stories, um, I really think about what questions are you asking and what story are you trying to tell? Like, what's that narrative? So um, in this one project I did around kind of mixed food stories, um, thinking about the Japanese, this wasn't explicitly Japanese Canadian um, but I know that two friends of mine talked about uh, their experience growing up eating chow mein sandwiches. And just, you can see like the, the joy in, in, in that story that they were telling me about that. Um, and in Steveston, I also talked to people who were uh, of Chinese uh, descent who grew up in Steveston, BC, uh, because I think that's another hidden history um, or a hidden story is like the history of Chinese uh, people in Steveston. And that was a memory project. So it was talking to people about their growing up in Steveston and kind of places and memories. So that was another joyful experience where I got to talk to people about, um, like for this person thinking about um, when he was a child, like this is the the place where he got his first bike. And I mean, it's a different store now, Um, but I think it's just about framing, uh, how thinking about the narratives the goal of the narrative and that narrative that you want to share. Thank you. And thank you for sharing those photos. Um, they're really fantastic. Uh, Imogen, it looks like you have. Uh, yes. Things- <laughs> I wanted to comment on the chow mein sandwich because uh, my students know me as the queen of chow mein sandwiches because I actually did a postdoc on it, but I did it on the East coast. But what I wanted to say about the chow mein here is that it's the Cumberland chow mein recipe. So if you look in, there's a couple of Japanese Canadian cookbooks uh, and it lists the Cumberland chow mein. Uh, And they also talk about the chow mein sandwich. So clearly 
you know, whatever hardships there were in Cumberland, either in Chinatown or number one Japanese town, there's also number five Japanese town, that the, uh, the connection between food is joyful. Because of course, when you're a kid, you don't know that what you, what you have is maybe not a lot, but because it's, it's connected to your family associations, it is joyful. The other thing with the uh, community in Cumberland has to do with the fact that they had um, roasting ovens. So, so you can imagine, you know, like fresh roasted pork or whatever, sort of wafting into the air. You know, it's a small community. You can imagine like, oh, it's roast day. You know, like maybe I'll get a little bit, you know, something will drop off. Uh, it's certainly something that uh, children found great joy because, you know, when you've got kids and you're, you know, chopping it up and, you know, people are, are buying, it's like, oh, sure, have a little piece, right? So, so really food is, is such a wonderful experience and uh, you know what uh, Lena well actually everybody has said the connection between indigenous peoples and other marginalized peoples so I think of you know China lily soy like if you if you talk to many indigenous peoples they will have <laughs> China lily soy in their cupboard and it's it's a statement of that connection to another community the sharing of, of food. Thank you for um, expanding upon the food connection and, and bringing in your, your experience and, and highlighting um, Cumberland Chamay, which apparently um, Michael's grandma also makes, um, mentioned in the chat. So that's so full circle, um, uh, food connections. Um, Lena, it seemed like you had something you wanted to share as well. No? Okay. Um, I mean, besides that, oh, like most of my food growing up is, is half uh, First Nations and half Chinese mixed together. Like everything is like hybridized. Like our, like um, fish and rice is like the two worlds merging and like our stir fry with cockles. Like it's nice. Uh, yeah. oh, it's amazing to hear about um, experience with food and, and the way that um, some of the um, kind of uh, multicultural communities that we were discussing um, before lives on through um, the food that we eat um, in the area. Um, Lena, do you have any thoughts to um, the question, as these marginalized histories are surfaced and shared, how do we build space for joy, joyful stories from the past? I'd have to, this is a really hard one. So, I mean, we asked a lot of our oral historians and heart historians about sort of um, how they feel about constantly sort of going over the worst parts of humankind and human history. <laughs> and most of them said that, um, that there, was, there was hope in sort of researching um, and researching history and, and digging in because if you, you had to be hopeful, I mean, that's the reason that you explore stories is that you know that you can learn from it and sort of have um, the future go a different way because it's, it's sort of honoring your resp responsibility to know the past. And so without that, they, they wouldn't even be researching or, or kind of researching these histories. I, I think our, our academics is a bit different than our oral histories. Um, our stories are just a lot different, our First Nation stories are sometimes, uh, um, they don't have like a, a, a middle and a, a beginning and a middle and an end. They're more about like learning as you grow up and you see things differently in, in them. But with this project, we weren't covering pre-contact history. We were mostly covering contact, which is a disruption. But as I said before, like resilience and survivance is, is something that's constant or else we wouldn't be here today. Um, but it's harder with the white lens, I have to say, like the white lens and the white gaze really wants to dig into uh, the likes to see the, the oppression and trauma because I think they haven't really been exposed to those portions and it actually gives them a different understanding. So audiences, audiences will see different things. We have to kind of, um, I think the resilient stories are super important. We have to show. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there 
joy, joyful stories are resilient stories. And I think the way that um, we can uh, show people um, persevering and, and um, continuing to uh, practice their culture, even when that is a radical act in and of itself, um, is something that's super powerful to see. Um, Kirsten, what about you? Um, as these marginalized histories are serviced and shared, how do we build space for the joyful stories from the past? Um, I am actually quite hopeful that if it's a big feat, but if more people start writing um, more holistically, and if, I mean, it's it's very fragmented history, uh, so. I think in the holistic storytelling, you'll get a mix of all of it. And I think particularly in smaller communities, um, at least I've seen a slight pattern in some of my background readings is um, very fond and loving relationships between white and marginalized community members not across the board, of course, but um, I, yeah, just different stories emerge. And I think uh, I just sort of see it like a line, you know, um, there will be really dark parts and there will be really fun parts and all the parts of a regular human existence um, will be reflected in that way uh, without kind of you know, focusing on the oppressive and the trauma, um, but not ignoring it either. So just different, different aspects will come out sort of naturally, I'm at least hopeful to say. <laughs> so I wanted to follow up what uh, Kirsten was saying, because, uh, you know, we're not hearing the stories from the smaller places. And when I think about, you know, going into communities, so some of the research that I've, I've done, like even for Cumberland, uh, because people went to school together. So those people that went to school, now they are our elders and they have very fond memories, you know, uh, of growing up, even going to Chinatown during uh, Lunar New Year, getting candy, you know, from the merchants and whatnot. And I remember, so this is also, like I said, where I am today has been a journey. So for me, I used to think, oh, Alert Bay, it's where the Namgis are. And then I found out that they had a Chinese community. It's like, oh, really? You know, and it wasn't like Chinatown as in Nanaimo or Chinatown as in Victoria or Vancouver. It was just that handful, just like what, what Kirsten is, is talking about. You know, there was a family, maybe two, three families, and that made up the, the Chinatown. But because there were children or whatnot, they had community because kids play. They don't recognize racism. They learn racism. So, so that's also our reminder that we need to have these stories talked about, not just in big places, but in those little places and to, to reaffirm the connections to the mixed communities that had existed at one time. Thank you all for your amazing answers to that question. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for audience questions today. So I'm going to pass it back to Michael, but I really appreciate all of your answers that you provided. Um, so thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Sydney. And thank you everyone for attending the event tonight. We'll wrap it up really quickly because we're, we're already slightly over time. Uh, I just wanted to quickly ask for a big favor for everyone in the audience. And that's to fill out the survey on the event. The survey actually allows us to advocate for, for future speaker series. And we also value your, your input and your opinions and, and how to make these better in the future as well. So please do take the 30 to 40 seconds to, to fill out the survey that's now posted in the chat. And to, to also let you know about our last event of the semester coming up in two weeks. So we'll be talking about radical imagination 
and the importance of imagination as we as we think about the multiplicity of futures um, that exist in a more equitable society. So please do join us in two weeks and you can find out about the upcom upcoming opportunities in the link tree that Sydney also posted in the chat. So yes, thank you, Lena, for posting your, your email as well. It's been a wonderful night. I've learned so much from the speakers. So thank you everyone for coming out and have a good night.